go back to John 20 again and pick up some more uh, thoughts from that wonderful chat. You should be familiar with the chapter now, right? As of this morning, we went through uh, the whole chapter quickly, but uh, hit the high spots. You ha should have an overview of it now in mind. And I'm hoping that as we go back there at this point, uh, things will really begin to pop out and that you'll be able to get a better grasp of it and it will be helpful. I want this to be practical. That's what this time is about. If you've ever wondered how you can live a life that really pleases God, and if you're a, a believer, a serious believer, that's, a, that's a, a thing that's important to you. If you want to experience a full, satisfying life, the answer really is here in John chapter 20. And it's really pretty simple. It doesn't have to be difficult to understand it. It's actually, it revolves around what's taking place in John 20, which is really, it's all about a risen living Christ. And that's what the Christian life is all about. That's how the Christian life is defined. It is the living Christ who is living his life in you, if you're a believer, because that's where he resides. What does that look like? Well, in this chapter, three ways. Number one, it looks like you seeking Christ. I mean all the time. Not just when you get saved, but especially after you get saved, you keep on seeking him, not for salvation, but you keep on seeking him so that you can know him better. You know, I thought I loved my wife when I first uh, fell in love with her. I guess that's what you call it. I thought I really loved her. I found out that, you know, we're, we're pushing, what, 47 years? Uh, I didn't really know what love was. I thought love was making me happy. You know what I found out? It's making her happy. That's what love really is about. And so in a relationship, whether it be with a, uh, another human being or whether it be with the Lord, you get to know them so that you can please them. That's what Christian living is about. So you seek them so that you can know them, so that knowing them, you can grow in your love for them. And then also in this chapter, not only do you have like Mary of Magdala seeking the Lord. Remember, she was seeking a dead Christ. He told her, you need to seek a living ascended Christ. But there is also when Jesus shows up in that upper room where the disciples are locked up and they're full of fear, he shows up and he says, Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. And then he says, as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. And so the Christian life is seeking Christ. It's also being sent by Christ. And there's a third part that is here in this chapter, because when he sends them, he tells them what they're to do. He says in the 23rd verse about uh, preaching a message of forgiveness of sin. That's That really is what verse 23 means. You, you know, only God can forgive sins, not us. And so the disciples, and as well as all believers, are here given the authority by the, the risen Christ to simply declare or proclaim what God does when a person accepts Jesus as Savior, their sins are forgiven, or when a person rejects Jesus as their Savior, guess what? Their sins are retained. Their sins are not forgiven. And so the Christian life is seeking Christ. It's being sent by Christ, and it's proclaiming the saving message of Christ. Seek, send, and save. That's really what this chapter is about, and that is what Christian living is about. Okay? Let's pause a moment and let's pray and ask God to really open our understanding even more. Lord, 
we thank you that you are the living Christ. And the fact of the matter is that if we belong to you, you live in us. Oh, Lord, your life is a person. It's you yourself. And I pray that the reality of that would really come home to our understanding. Open our eyes. Lord, show us what a wonderful life it is. The life of Jesus in us. Now, I pray today that the truth that we've been thinking about so far would go much deeper and it'd be much more comprehended by us. It'd be overwhelming to us when we pause to really think what you are and what you do and what you've purposed and planned for every single believer. What it makes our lives really exciting. And we pray that that kind of excitement that's grounded in this truth will grip us today and will motivate us. In Jesus' name, amen. So go with me in John 20, once again, to verse 15. This is where Jesus is connecting with uh, Mary of Magdala. She doesn't know yet who he is. And so he asks her those two questions. But he asks her, whom seekest thou? And then when he reveals himself by saying her name, Jesus said under verse 16, Mary, and immediately she turned herself and she says to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher or master teacher really is what. Here's the first thing that is involved in living the Christian life, a successful life. And it involves a life that is focused on the risen Christ. A life that is Christ-centered in him. Now, if you'll look at the 16th verse and the way that she responds to her Savior, you'll see that a life that seeks the Lord is a life that is surrendered to the power of the risen Christ. She calls him Master, our King James Version, Master. And when you think of master, you think of his lordship, his sovereignty, his supremacy over you as an individual. And so the way that you, when you seek Christ, when you truly seek him, you know what you do? You surrender to him. And you surrender to his power over your life. Your self-determination ends. You abandon autonomy, self-rule. And you abandon being independent of the Lord. You give up the control and the domination of your own life. And you hand it totally over to the Lord. Have you ever done that? You know, that really is a wonderful and and uh, just a, a a relief when you take everything that has to do with you and you surrender it to the lordship of Jesus Christ and you recognize him as the master and you're no longer in charge but he is boy it takes a lot of pressure off you it really is a blessing it is a blessed life and seeking him first of all involves us surrendering power to the risen Christ. That's what verse 16 is about. Jesus says, who do you seek? Well, if you're seeking him, it begins by surrendering power to the risen Christ, surrendering authority to him. Here's a second thing. Look at verse 17. When she realizes who it is, she it's like she falls at his feet and grabs his, his ankles and she clings to him like, I'm never going to let you go again. Jesus responds to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. And literally what he's saying is, don't cling to me. There is a new relationship here that is going to be established. 
I'm no longer going to be physically present with you. I'm going to ascend to my father. You're going to have to get accustomed to my spiritual presence. So don't cling to my physical body. Don't cling to me physically being with you because I want you to learn this new relationship of my spiritual presence because I'm going to live in you. You know, when Jesus was physically present, if he was in the Galilee and you were his disciple and you were down in Jerusalem, you'd be miles apart. He wouldn't be with you at all physically. But now, because the risen Christ has through his spirit come to live in every single believer, guess what? There's nowhere on this earth that you can be where Jesus isn't with you because he's in you. And so he's helping her, and this is what seeking Christ will teach you, not only to surrender power to the risen Christ, but to realize your position in the risen Christ. And your position in the risen Christ is that you are in him who is ascended already and is seated on the throne. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm not going to turn there, uh, beginning at verse 19 down to verse 22, it talks about Jesus after he rose, the, the, the power of his resurrection, he sat down on the throne, and it, and it says, and all the demonic and evil spirits and the hierarchy of those evil powers are under his feet. He's seated above them all. He's in authority and power over them all. They're under his feet. That's chapter one. Go to chapter two. And in the sixth verse, you know what it says? It says that if you're a believer, you are seated in on that throne in Christ, which means that all those evil powers are under your feet because you're in Christ. So when you seek him, not only do you surrender power to the risen Christ, but you get an idea and you realize your position in the risen Christ. And that is that he's enthroned and you're in him. So you're enthroned with him. You're seated with him, which gives you supreme power in this evil world. Because Jesus said, or it's said about him, in 1 John 3, I think in verse 8, that for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, revealed in this earth, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he did. That's what Calvary is about. You wonder, well, then why is there a devil if he's got destroyed at Calvary? Well, because... It, the, the realization of that has not yet hit, but his power has been broken. And in the spirit realm, in the spiritual realm, believers have power over these supernatural beings, these evil spirits, because of our position in Christ. In fact, he says to us in that same epistle to 1 John, the next chapter, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And so when you seek Christ and you, you uh, surrender to the power of the risen Christ, you know what happens? You then begin to understand and realize the wonderful position you have in Christ. This position of supremacy over all evil spirits. But there's another thing. In verse 21, uh, and also in verse 26, two times, he says to these disciples, peace be unto you. See that verse? Uh, actually, uh, I think it's verse 19. Peace be unto you. Um, again, in verse 21, peace be unto you. He said it again in verse 26, peace be unto you, three times in this chapter. Do you get the message? <laughs> it's simply this. If you seek the Lord, not only does that involve surrender of power to the risen Christ and a realization of your position in the risen Christ, but it will enable you to acquire peace in the risen Christ. You know what that peace is? That peace is 
it's, it's really nothing that this world knows anything of. As I quoted in the morning, John 14, 27, Jesus says, I have a gift for you. I'm going to leave a legacy to you. You know what that legacy is? My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Jesus' peace is nothing like the world's peace. Uh, the world's peace is, you know, if we can calm down and not have wars and we can just all get along with one another, we can just get along, we'll have peace. That's not anything like the peace that Jesus says is my gift to you. It's a peace that is a deep down calmness while everything else is out of whack and everything's out of control. Doesn't mean that you don't have any more troubles. It means that you face your troubles so differently. You acquire this supernatural peace. It's what Paul said when he says, don't worry about anything. But rather, pray about everything. Pray about everything. And he says, you know what the result is going to be? The peace of God that is beyond human imagination that is beyond human comprehension will stand guard duty over your mind and heart. You'll have the peace of God guarding your inner person, your the inner control center of your being. So you seek the Lord. There's so many wonderful benefits. You get all the relief of not having to worry about who runs things? You surrender power to the risen Christ. As a result, you then begin to realize your position in the risen Christ of supremacy, seated on the throne with him. You acquire peace in the risen Christ. And there's a fourth thing I, I see here in verse 29. Jesus says to Thomas, because you've seen me, you believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You exercise faith in the risen Christ when you seek him, because when you know him, you seek him, you know him. And when you begin to know him, not only do you love him, but you realize, you know what? I can totally trust this person. I can trust him in every situation. And so you exercise faith, which is dependence. You exercise dependence upon him in your life. And the way to access and obtain all of the promised gifts that God says our, our provision as believers is by faith. It's by dependence upon what he says. And so that's what it means to seek the Lord. And this is the first part of a successful life, is seeking. The second part, go back to verse 21b and uh, 22. 21b, he says, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And then he equipped them for it. He breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So here's the second thing. A successful Christian life, not only is that you seek him, that it involves the, a, a focused life centered in the risen Christ, but it means you're sent by him. And that is a life, uh, embracing a life of obedience to the risen Christ. So send I you. There's a, a song, wonderful song in our hymn book. We don't sing it very often, but we should. And that's the title of it. So send I you. So send I you to labor unrewarded, at least in this life, to bear you know, the cross, to bear the shame, to bear the pain, but we're sent. He says, that's, you know, that's God's purpose for the Christian life. It's not just so that you, in seeking him, get all of this good stuff for yourself so that you get spiritually fat and become happy all the time, but you seek him so that he can send you. And you embrace a life of obedience to the risen Christ. And uh, you find God's purpose for your life is being sent out by him. You're all sent. I'm not the only sent one here this, morning, this afternoon. You're all sent. 
It's not just Pastor Dan and I. We're all sent. All of the, these guys weren't ordained ministers that he's talking to. These disciples, yes, they became apostles. But this applies not just to them. It applies to the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're sent. Now, here's what it means to be sent by the Lord. As the Father hath sent me, Jesus said, so send I you. Isn't that amazing? Think of the Father sending the Son. What a mission he was on, right? Total redemptive mission. That doesn't mean that we that uh, that we do what Jesus did. As we we can't we can't provide redemption. But there is a redemptive factor in us being sent. And the first part of it is this. If you are sent by Jesus as the Father sent him, then you must have the heart of the risen Christ. You must have the heart of the risen Christ. The Father sent Jesus, and he sent him to lay down his life. And Jesus is basically saying, now I'm sending you to lay down your life. Maybe not physically, but if necessary, yes. I'm asking you to surrender to me your whole life. He's calling us, if we're sent, to have the heart of the risen Christ. It means that you have a heart of selfless sacrifice. That uh, you are ready to deny yourself and even spiritually die to yourself, say no to yourself. You know why? So that others can live. You die so others can live. That's what it means to have the heart of Christ. Paul said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And then what a humiliation follows that, right? The steps of our Lord's humiliation. He's the Lord of glory, and he takes upon himself human form and takes upon himself a human nature. And then he submits himself to be brutalized and mocked and so cruelly tortured and treated by wicked humans, even to be pinned by nails in his wrists and ankles to a cross. Even the death of the cross. Well, that's what having the heart of Jesus is, the risen Christ. Jesus said it this way. If anyone wants to follow me, you got to hate your own life. Can't love your own life. You got to let go of your plans. If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself or herself. Let that individual, that believer, take up his cross. That is, whatever it is that God calls you to do. Take up his cross and follow me at all costs. You've settled it. It doesn't matter how much it's going to cost me. It doesn't matter how long this is going to last. Because the heart of the risen Christ that sends me is a selfless sacrifice. That kind of an attitude. And there's another part of this being sent. We're talking about You want to live a successful life. This doesn't sound like a very successful one, does it? I mean, giving up your plans, giving up your your cherished ambitions, your desires for your life. Oh, you have it all planned out, right? This is what I'm going to be when I grow up. Or this is what I'm, I'm striving for. This is why I'm going to school. This is what I'm hoping to accomplish. Look, that's all fine and good if that is the will of God for you. But if it's not the will of God, then... You got it backwards. You got to first of all find out what the Lord have the heart of the risen Christ, and then you can share the mission with the risen Christ. Yeah, you know, we call it the Great Commission. You ever think about that word commission? It's a mission that you are co-laboring with someone else. You are commissioned. In other words, you are a co-laborer or a co-worker with Jesus. It's the great co-mission. 
It's you and him partnering together. You share the mission with the risen Christ. This is what successful living is. If you're just going about fulfilling your agenda, what you've always wanted to do in your life, you're not living a successful life. I don't care how much money you're bringing in. I don't care how good you feel about yourself. If you're not sharing the mission of Christ in what you do, you're not living a successful Christian life. We're co-laborers. We represent him. Remember, Jesus said in that upper room with those disciples in John 13, he says, you know what? Whoever receives me receives my father because we're one. And then he goes on and says this absolutely amazing thing. He says, and whoever receives you receives me because the believer in Christ are one. And that's why when Saul of Tarsus was struck down on that road to Damascus. Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What do you mean? Well, you're persecuting my people. When you do that, you persecute me because we're one. And so we share the mission with the risen Christ. To reject Christ, uh, to reject us rather, is to reject Christ. To receive us is, is to receive Christ when we minister, when we share the mission with him. It's not you, it's Christ. We're in absolute union with him. And then there's a third area in being sent. Not only sharing the heart of Christ, or, or rather having the heart of Christ, sharing the mission of Christ, but look at what he says in that 22nd verse. He breathes on them and he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. To be sent. In a successful Christian life, to be sent is to each day receive the power of the risen Christ. That same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and empowered him in his earthly ministry is necessary in your life because any self-effort on our part is totally insufficient. Jesus said it. He said, the flesh profited nothing. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, I can do a lot of things. I can accomplish a lot of things from a human standpoint. But in the eyes of God, spiritual ministry can only be accomplished by receiving the anointing and the spirit power of God. And that's why he said to his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued or clothed, clothed with power from on high. And he said, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witnesses unto me in all of these different geographical areas. Receive the power of the risen Christ. And the third and final thing, I'm taking us to verse 23, where he says those kind of cryptic words, whoever sins you remit or forgive, they're forgiven. Whosoever sins you don't forgive, retain. They're retained. And again, I told you that this is just the Lord giving authority for us to declare what happens to a person when they either receive or reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the third part of successful living. It's seeking. It's being sent. And then here, it's proclaiming the saving message of the gospel. It's a life that is occupied with the risen Christ agenda. This is his agenda. This is not our agenda. This is his agenda. Our life is to be occupied with the risen Christ agenda, which is soul saving, which is the gospel proclamation. It's declaring the gospel everywhere we go, as you go, wherever that might be. Proclamation of the forgiveness of sin is what he's talking about here. A life occupied with the risen Christ's agenda. The Moravians, well, I don't think they even exist much anymore at all, but they were a godly people in the 1700s. And they had a motto that they came up with. And their motto was this, to win for the Lamb the reward of his sufferings. 
to win for the Lamb the reward of his sufferings. That what Jesus suffered, that it might, that he might be paid back by the people that he uses us to bring to faith in him. To win for the Lamb the reward of his sufferings. Because remember, Jesus said, that's my mission. That's my agenda. To seek and to save that which was lost. I've come not to be served. I've come to be a servant and to give my life a ransom for many. This is a faithful saying that Christ Jesus came to this world for one purpose, to save sinners. That's his agenda. That's the message here that we're sent to proclaim. It's a saving message. It's about forgiveness of sin. It's announcing forgiveness of sin in the risen Christ. You know what forgiveness means? Forgiveness means to release or to set free. And so when we preach forgiveness of sin, when we proclaim forgiveness of sin, we are proclaiming a release, a setting free from the penalty of sin, which is death. In hell, it is a release from that penalty through the cleansing blood's removal of sin. You know, when sin, when God forgives it, when it's cleansed by the blood, it no longer exists. It's totally removed. It's not just covered over. It's totally gone like it never even existed. This is the forgiveness that we proclaim. It's a saving announcement of the forgiveness of sin in the risen Christ. But you know, that would be wonderful in itself. If that's all that forgiveness of sin meant, if that's all that he meant when he said, uh, your sins are remitted, are forgiven, if that's all that he meant, that would be wonderful. But it means more than that. When we proclaim the saving gospel of the risen Christ, it is that we affirm not only the forgiveness of sin, but freedom from sin in the risen Christ. That is, deliverance from the the power through the conquering cross that was victorious over sin. It was at the cross that Jesus completely conquered sin, had complete victory over it. Which means this, no matter what the sin is that you or I as an individual struggle with, he can break the chains of it, no matter what it is. He can set you free and completely deliver you from that sin that so easily besets you and holds you in its bondage. His forgiveness is to release you and free you and deliver you. And we affirm that in our message of deliverance through the, uh, uh, from power of sin through the conquering cross that is victorious over it. Because Jesus died, sin's done for. Sin is crushed. The power of it. We don't have to sin. We choose to, but we don't have to. It has no power once you become a believer to make you sin. And then I believe it also, and this is interesting because I think Brother Dave uh, mentioned this perhaps in a prayer uh, after the morning service. And that is, as believers, when we talk about the forgiveness of sin, when we talk about sin, we anticipate the extinction of sin in the risen Christ. That is, there is coming an eternal removal of sin's very existence. There is going to be a day when there will be no such thing as sin that is present in the new world, in the new creation that we yet have experienced, have yet to experience. See, salvation is really amazing. There's a phase of it that we haven't realized yet where sin won't even be an issue in anyone's life. There will be nothing. There'll be no such thing as sin in the new world, in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and new earth. That wonderful. No more sin. Gone forever. 
God totally conquers it through Christ. And it becomes extinct. And that's one species I can't wait until sin is extinct. Dan Crawford was a missionary. He spent most of his adult life serving as a missionary in Africa. And it was time for him to return home to his home in Britain. He went to an old uh, chieftain of the tribe that he was working with. Uh, and he told them that he was about to return home. He also told them about, uh, he told this man about the, some of the modern miracles that he had there in Britain. Talked about ships that ran under the water as well as uh, on the water and about uh, ships, meaning airplanes that actually flew in the skies, ships that uh, flew in the sky. And he described some of the wonderful uh, houses and the conveniences, the modern conveniences in those houses that uh, he was going back to in England. And when he was done, he waited for this old African chief to respond. And his, to his amazement, he said, well, Mr. Crawford, is that all? And uh, Dan said, yes, I, I think it is. And so the chief said very slowly and and uh, and uh, sincerely, well, Mr. Crawford, you know, to be better off is not to be better. To be better off is not to be better. Successful Christian living is not that you're the sharpest knife in the drawer. You know what I mean? It's not that you have that that you're the smartest person. It's not that you have the greatest gifts. It's not that you're more talented than someone else. It's not that you are using the latest methods. It's not that you possess nicer things or you have the most finances or followers. But successful Christian living is that you hunger for God and you hunger for his word. And you humbly partner with the risen Christ, depending upon him to fulfill his will in and through your life in reaching other people. That's successful living. That's what it means to be better. Not necessarily better off.